And with the dulcet tones of the Zoom robot, we are now live uh, with the Transportation Standing Committee special meeting for April 29th, uh, 2021. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm your chair, uh, Councilor Way Mason, District 7, Halifax South Downtown. Uh, as per our custom in these Zoom times, I'm going to go through the uh, members uh, in ask them to do a camera and audio check. Uh, the first two on my list are not here yet and have both sent uh, regrets that they'll be joining us when they can. So Councillor Kent uh, from District 3 and Councillor Mancini from District 6 will be joining us uh, when they are able. That brings us to Councillor Stoddard, District 12. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and friends and colleagues. I'm here and ready to go. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Russell. Uh, good afternoon from wonderful Lower Sackville. Uh, looking forward to this uh, Zoom meeting. Hopefully it'll be fast in transportation. Thank you. So many jokes to be made. Deputy Mayor Outfit. I'm, I'm biting my tongue, Mr. Chair. I am, I am here and glad to be here and sending hi to all my colleagues and our guests and staff comfortable walking speed like there's lots of jokes in there for us Tim we'll, we'll have to unpack that later I, I know he, he makes it so easy Paul doesn't <laughs> he? Uh, we also have a number of guests today uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon would you care to check in with us thank you very much Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Transportation Standing Committee staff and colleagues uh, thank you for allowing me to sit in and uh, be part of my learning journey and what a journey it is. Uh, I feel that. Councillor Cleary. Hello, colleagues. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, well, it was a near run thing, but we decided in the end to let you come. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, a learning journey with many speed bumps, I hope. <laughs> well, many, stop traffic. Many. Just slow it down a little, make it manageable. Thanks Manage for that congestion. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. So uh, uh, we also are joined by an extraordinary amount of staff. So I'm not going to uh, go through those uh, each today, but I'd like to thank them all for coming to support us on the matters before us today. And uh, uh, let's just have a mic check on our uh, clerk and on our solicitors. So we'll go to Andrea first. Can you uh, say hello for us? Hi, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Colin, you there? I am here. Perfect. All right. So uh, this meeting has been called to order. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of April 15th, 2021. Uh, so moved, Councillor Russell. Moved by Councillor okay. Russell, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Uh, are there any errors or omissions in the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move to the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Moved to item three, approval of the order of business. Madam Clerk, are there any additions to the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chair, there's no additions to the agenda. There was one item that was coming forward, but I had not received unanimous consent prior to the meeting. So when Councillor Mancini comes to the meeting, we can um, ask if he consents to the item being added then. If okay, you thank you very much. So for uh, the councillors, that's item 15, one proposed amendments to HRM bylaw T1000 uh, that uh, Councillor Kent had circulated yesterday. So we'll have to wait for Councillor Mancini to join the meeting. Uh, so uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to, sorry, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that we change the order to allow the two presentations before deferred business. Very good. So that would bring 10.3 presentations to uh, after uh, item seven, motions or rescission and before 8.1 Herring Cove Road Functional Plan. Uh, moved by Councillor Outhead. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Seconded by Councillor Russell. Uh, any uh, objection to that amendment? Any further discussion? Uh, we'll Question. vote on the amendment first and we'll vote on the amended uh, uh, order of business. So any questions? None. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Uh, so do members have any other requests for additions or deletions? So I'll take a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended. Well, we already have that on the ground. It's been, so it was right, yeah. Councillor Russell and Councillor Stoddard. So that's been moved and seconded. It was in track already. We're only on the second item. Uh, any further discussion on the uh, motion as amended? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Perfect. Opposed? We have an agenda. Thank you very much, everybody. 
So there's no business arising. There's no, uh, so there's a next item, item five, call for declaration of conflict of interest. Seeing none, there are no motions of rescission and there are no motions of reconsideration before us today. So that brings us to 10.3.1. We have two presentations today. Uh, the first is on safety issues related to signalized intersections and crosswalks. So I will, uh, each presentation today will have 10 minutes to speak. We ask, we ask the, the script that we have says no cheering or booing during a presentation, but since we're on the internet, I, I doubt that will happen today. The language should be respectful and parliamentary. Uh, when the presentation is over, committee members may wish, wish to ask questions of clarification. And as a reminder, these have to be questions of clarification about what the person has presented, not debate, as there will be no motion on the floor. If committee members wish to bring a motion to ask for a report or action, they are asked to bring a motion with due notice to the next meeting of the committee. So with that stated, we'll move first to uh, the uh, intersections of crosswalks. And I'd like to welcome Martin Williams and Milena. And forgive me, I don't know how to say your last name, Melina. You'll have to school me. I'll remember for the next time if they would like to present. Just how about you just say Mason? Mason? Melana Mason. Is that your other last name? No, <laughs> it's Cousin Avitus, but thank you for trying. <laughs> Cousin of vicious? Cousin, no, not vicious. No, vicious. Vicious? That's right. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, please take it away. You'll have 10 minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping my uh, my colleague Martin is here. I see him on the right screen. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm right here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm um, currently an imposter broadcasting from a, a small corner of countryside in England. So I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm back. Is it just me or is I, I can't hear uh, Martin. Yeah, I'm sorry. Martin, your volume that's is a very good thing. low if you could turn Maybe it up. Maybe that's a good thing. I love giving Martin a hard time, but uh, I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you hear me now at all? Still very quiet. The Still volume is quiet. faint. Are you able to turn up the volume on your mic? Um, I'm just trying now. Um, yeah, it's up at full volume. Mm. I don't know if that makes any difference at all. I can try joining from a different computer. Um, I don't know if I'm able to rejoin in five minutes, if you can skip to something else. Um, is everybody okay with just jamming up your volume for now so we can continue? I'm asking the committee. I'm fine. Okay. No objections. All right, so just try and yell into your microphone there, uh, Mr. Williams. Carry on. I will do. Um, can you hear me okay now? It's okay. Better. It's yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I'm um, I'm uh, currently away from Halifax, um, but I've been following events closely. Um, I've been speaking to family members and um, remain very concerned about um, safety at signalized intersections. So. Um, I'm going to pass on to Milena, um, but I just have a few slides to very quickly go through um, just to sort of highlight the key issues and facts. Um, so this was taken about three years ago. It just shows the uh, multiple conflicts moving in on pedestrians as they cross, um, which uh, provides a lot for people to think about, and uh, particularly for those less stable, seniors, children, um, people with learning and physical disabilities, um, it is a challenge. Um, so if we can move on to slide two. Um, so this is just uh, the recent situation um, over a 12 month period, uh, two um, pedestrian fatalities um, and a life threatening injury at uh, Bedford and Convoy Run. Um, so you can see they're very wide intersections um, no protection for pedestrians at all. Um, so uh, very vulnerable to this uh, traffic movement while people are crossing. Um, slide three, please. Um, so I did some data crunching from the open portal and saw that um, are at 72% of pedestrian and cyclist incidents, and that's 490 of 684 since the beginning of uh, um, 2018 occurred at intersections from what I could see. Um, so that's a very high proportion of incidents at these locations. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and again, from the uh, data uh, that I was looking at, I could see a lot of um, incidents focused along um, uh, artery roads here. So Roby, uh, Chibucto, uh, Mumford, and Joe Howe. Um, uh, uh, this is, tends to be where the intersection incidents are concentrated. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so going back a little bit further, there was some very good data crunching done in 2018. Um, so this is a pedestrian semi-annual report, and it shows very high consistent le proportion of incidents at signalized intersections here, um, um, owing to the lack of safety infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the even better data here, it shows a breakdown of the um, incidents by turning movement, and you can see a very high proportion of left-hand uh, turns, so, and quite a lot of right turns, so that would be right turn on green and right turn on red. Um, and so overall, that was between 39 and 69 incidents a year uh, over that six-year period that were caused by turning drivers at signalized intersections. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, from the very helpful pedestrian safety semi-annual report, um, it says consistently um, the most common cause of collisions are these um, are related to a left turn uh, movement at signalized intersections. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, this shows the conflict points. Um, uh, some of them are coming kind of from behind you as you cross, so they're a little difficult to cite. This left on green in particular uh, will just come out of you, um, and before you know it, someone's just whizzing past your face or behind you. Um, also, the right on green and right on red can come from behind you. Um, I'm sure all of you walk enough to appreciate this um, and how dangerous it is. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, so this is some of the education that exists um, that, that we've seen that there is a sign here uh, warning pedestrians to look for turning vehicles. And also um, this is an extract from uh, Nova Scotia um, uh, pedestrian, which um, uh, tells us to keep watching as you cross and thank drivers with a wave and a smile. Um, I don't usually wave. It's usually more of a finger gesture. Um, but the point here is... Um, uh, it, it's, this is a, a frozen in, in time uh, image, um, but it's, it's more challenging than it looks from these frozen images. It's a, a very difficult task, particularly for seniors, children, and um, people with disabilities. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, so having a look at some research has shown that drivers are focused on the um, the, the the move that they need to make to get through oncoming traffic safely. They need to find a gap in traffic uh, to get through. And often they're not thinking about pedestrians at all or the pedestrians out of sight, um, kind of um, um, seen very, very late indeed, um, or not at all. Um, so you can see here that, that the, the pedestrians are kind of not in the line of sight of the driver. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, last time I asked, I could not, um, staff could not give me any information on the yield rates, the overall yield rates um, for um, pedestrians by drivers. So um, um, looking at research elsewhere in Florida with, with some very visible signage, the yield rate was around 67%. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are some drawings my kids drew. They they go um, they used to go up and down Lacewood and Joe Howe a lot. Um, so they kind of drew a picture showing the challenge, the traffic movements. Um, um, I I did this partly because um, children don't get to say they don't get to decide infrastructure, but they get to use it. Um, so they observe the challenge and they know the danger, but they don't really get to give input or make decisions. Um, and perhaps um, adult concerns are, are, are what, what um, we think about the most. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so I can't see the slide properly here, but this shows a uh, intersection which I really like um, uh, because uh, left turning traffic is held with a red light. There's a special left turn signal. Um, so it actually feels absolutely fine. You've got traffic moving through the intersection um, as you cross, but nothing turning um, over the crosswalk. So it feels a lot safer. Uh, next, safe, uh, next slide, please. Um, so leading pedestrian intervals, uh, the US Department of Transport say they reduce pedestrian incidents by 13%, and that's on quite extensive testing, lots of cities. Um, um, uh, they don't, uh, they're still permissive yield, so um, yeah, pedestrians are still struck um, due to this left turn on green move. The idea is that pedestrians are more visible, but, but it doesn't um, assure uh, safety. You've still got the conflict. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, by the way. Can anyone update me? About one minute, 45 seconds left. Right. OK, I'm going to skip these slides and go straight to Milena then. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask Milena to take over. OK, can everybody hear me? Oh. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if there, we can get to a slide that um, I can't, don't remember the number, but it's the intersection of Bears, Young and Windsor. It's up. Uh, OK, good. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to speak very quickly on the on the lived experience of a person who's completely blind, travels with a guide dog and not on behalf of people with all disabilities, but just from my perspective. So this intersection, which is an octopus snake pit to me, um, I do give a thumbs up to our new uh, traffic light supervisor, William Keepen, who after 13 years will be putting in an APS system in there. So thank you very much to that. At the north, at the southeast corner of that intersection in particular, Lynn Martin has spoken of numbers of incidents, but the close calls are not being um, accommodated for and they're not being reported because who remembers to put in the close call. I'm pretty certain every single councillor on the TSC has come close calls when they've been on foot. This is an intersection where I'm constantly, if I have to cross this intersection two times a week, at least once a week, there's a close call where a car is zooming behind my rear end or in front of me while it is my right of way to be crossing. That southeast corner has a pole for a button um, for regular sighted able-bodied pedestrians that is actually interfering uh, for drivers to be able to see. If we can have the next slide, which should be uh, the corner of Almond and Windsor, perfect straight on crossings, all APS is working. Again, thank you, Mr. William Keepin. Um, here is an intersection. If you can see the curb cuts that are there, these are the ramps that permit those who use wheelchairs to get in and out of the, the intersection into the crosswalk. They're cut too wide. The, these have been changed in the last six, seven years, at least three times and once and for all, it gives the privilege to a driver when they're making that right on red to come right up onto that curb. And I will attest for at least five individuals who are visually impaired with their white canes listening for the parallel traffic to move across that the cars are riding over, their canes have been ridden over. I have had three guide dogs in my lifetime and I have had two of them hit by a car, not severely by what these actions are being performed by the right on red. Furthermore, a person who is using a wheelchair or a mobility aid such as a walker or parents with strollers cannot move back fast enough when that driver is turning their head to the left to squeeze themselves in to get themselves where they need to be making that right on the red. I am only of one opinion that I do not believe in shared responsibility in a crosswalk. You have a privilege as a driver. I did as well before losing my sight. It is your responsibility to be stopping, watching, and proceeding very carefully. I'm not speaking to the counselors, but to everyone that is listening. We need to make a change. Let me tell you also that the left-hand turns, um, and there is no more slides on my, my part, but the left-hand turns that are coming on, on um, intersections such as Quinpool and Oxford, which do not have an APS at this moment, um, where the early left-hand turn goes, we again, those with the visual impairments, listen for the parallel traffic. So Quimple and Oxford, the traffic starts to move, but there's also a green light to make a left. I refuse to cross there any longer because I have been caught and almost run over on numerous occasions and so have many others, including an elderly friend of mine who was sighted uh, at seven years old, got tapped, 
no major injury, but wasn't reported. So these are incidents that are happening daily. So and we really we're need up to, to we're up to 12 minutes now. I gave you two extra right. minutes. So if you could wrap up. Yeah, wrapping up. So we really need to put in uh, new implementations, signs, and uh, it, just to make people aware to drive that point home. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your presentation today. Uh, are there any questions from the of clarification from the committee? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, to the presenter the presenters today. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, uh, you know we thank you for both for your diligence. Uh, will we see you, uh, Malena, next week, next month? I feel like it's a regular thing now. <laughs> Don't wish for that. Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right. Thank you both very much. So we'll thank move you. on to uh, ten point three point two, which is Bears Road widening closure of George Daphne. We have a presentation from Eric Thompson and Ted Vaughn. Are you both in the meeting? Yes, we are. Councilor Mancini has joined us. Uh, Councilor, we are in the uh, uh, second presentation. We moved them to before uh, uh, 8.1. So we're about to hear from uh, Bears Road, George Daphne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, so uh, same injunctions as last time. Uh, uh, you'll have 10 minutes. I'll give you a one minute warning. I should have said that to the last group. Uh, and uh, the councilors may ask for uh, clarification when we get to the end. Uh, thank you, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for letting us speak today. Uh, Eric Thompson, um, myself, and Bill Campbell uh, have been engaged um, by the people of Westmount uh, to, for this discussion today. Really, to summarize what we'd like to get at the end of this is a temporary stay at the closure. We're not asking for any changes to the widening of uh, Bears Road or the bike lane. We just need a creative solution. So if we could turn the page... This is the uh, plan that's currently in place. This was the plan that sort of caught us off guard. If you can go to the next slide. This is the plan that uh, many of us thought was gonna happen. And you can see there's quite a difference between the two with the ability to turn in the neighborhood. So we go to the next slide, please. So when the commu uh, community found out about this in November of 2019, um, they brought it to the counselor at a meeting and the counselor became aware of it at that time too. And what we've found in this particular case is that there's a lack of professional attention to safety within and in relation to the design of Westmount. And we're gonna bring some of that forward now. So we could turn the page, please. So you can see some of the features of Westmount. I won't go into the details, uh, but uh, it's quite a unique area. So if you turn the page again, and you can see that um, the red, red uh, um, circles with a dash in it is some of the uh, entrance and exits that we have now that are very restricted. And the one intersection we sort of have that's unencumbered is Almond and Cannot, but that does have restrictions to it too, but that's our primary uh, in intersection. So uh, if we could, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Mike Connors, transportation engineer said, as a result of the proposed changes to George Dauphine, the intersection of Shabucto Road and William Hunt will be the only intersection that permits full access to the neighborhood at all times. This is a non-signalized intersection. So if you could turn one uh, page, this is the intersection. And if you look at this intersection, you will see that it's not an intersection that you can pass through. You can't walk through it. You cannot drive through it. The traffic backs up to the rotary. It begins at 245. And when um, people leave the neighborhood with their school children, it backs up inside the neighborhood. This is the typical bus uh, busy time of the day. In the morning, the traffic's opposite and then it's inbound. Next slide, please. So what you have here is you basically have a six lane uh, uh, throughway that is articulated as our, our only exit after uh, the George Daphne uh, changes. Our only, uh, the words, um, um, true, uh, full, per full access. So if you go to the next slide, please. That's just an image of almost, uh, you might call it the West End mini, mini commons. Uh, we have a lot of people to come in and out of the neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. 
So what we're asking for here, today, again, is just a temporary stay of the closure. We're not asking for things to be redone. We're asking, not asking for the, uh, any kind of changes to bike lanes or anything like that. Um, we have been in direct contact with the residents and that's the support we have. So if you go to the next slide, please. You will see a letter of support from our counselor and I'm glad to see our counselors here today. Um, we support the widening, dedicated bus lanes and bikeways. And I wanna make that clear. Next slide, please. So this is a matter of safety for us. It's safety for the children, safety for the residents, safety for the users of the facilities. And also we, we've had an opportunity to FOIP up information about this. And we brought out some of the fire uh, and emergency services correspondence. And we know that they were contacted just prior to our meeting in December, 2019, uh, 12 months after the approval of this intersection for their comments. And they wanted a live test. And at that time, in some of their correspondence, they were opposed entirely to the design turn and that they argued that they needed a real world test and they insisted at a minimum that they have a, a simulation. So um, there, there clearly were some things that uh, we feel should have happened that didn't happen. And as a survivor of St. Agnes School fire, I will tell you when a school burns down, it burns down very fast. We got out of that school and that's in that neighborhood and we got out when the flames were and the smoke was coming out the soffits. Twelve firefighters were injured in that uh, that um, fire. Uh, next slide, please. So, the, in our in our opinion, there's been a, a lack of consultation. We talked to the principals and the SAC at the, at Westmount School. They're not aware of it. We know that there's four months of negotiations with Halifax Shopping Center, and the consultation with us only came in after we found out about the bump out, and that. We are concerned that um, the 2017 IMP requires examination of project impacts, and we feel that that's been missed, and that the local bikeway admin order 2016 002 um, requires consultation to be carried out, and we don't believe that that was done. So there's an absence of impact analysis. Um, 11 months after the decision was made to do this design, we had one day of traffic study in November of 2019. And we don't feel that that's been at, um, adequate. Staff acknowledge that the process was not perfect and that if they had it over again, they definitely or they would do it differently. And the consultant that we talked to in our, our conversations said that safety was not in his mandate. And I will tell you, safety is in all our mandates, no matter what you do. And we have a quote from Roddy McIntyre, who's the HRM traffic uh, analyst and traffic authority, and quote, I have, some concern, I have some concerns that allowing exit only at this location will have a negative and unpopular impacts on residents and the school. This proposal will leave access for the neighborhood via Allman and William Hunt only. More information needs to be provided regarding the overall impact and benefits drawbacks to this proposal. And that's exactly how we feel. We feel there needs to be a time. So what we're asking for today is that the committee recommend that temporary postponement of the closure of George Dauphine until staff and consultants can uh, address our concerns. Uh, we'd like a report and we'd like the impacts to be closer examined in terms of what happens with Westmount, how do things egress in around the neighborhood and what kind of carbon impact we create by making cars no longer turn in and immediately get to the school, but to go around the neighborhood and then they loop through the neighborhood to pull up onto the right side of the school. So um, we, we feel that you've got the skill set and that you could find an alternative to this uh, turn. Um, and we'd like you to recommend and carry this forward for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We always appreciate a seven minute, 30 second presentation in a 10 minute slot. So thank you for that. I don't see anybody on the uh, chat list. Is there anybody who are in the chat? Oh, yeah. Councillor and Deputy Mayor Outfit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Ted, thank you for the presentation. And Eric never sounded better either. So um, I wanted to uh, just say now, and I don't know if Councillor Cleary is going to speak to this or not as a guest, but we've been given a presentation and just checking on process here. If and we can't order stay, we can't, you know, these sorts of things, but we can request a staff report in response 
to the presentation, I believe. And if that is in order, I'm happy to move that. If that would be helpful, Mr. Chair. So, so as I said, when I uh, read the uh, uh, new injunctions, the uh, we don't have yeah. notice uh, for a motion, and we haven't worked up a motion with staff. So the practice we had when I was chair on CPD, which yeah. I, I think is going to become normalized across the committees, is that. Uh, uh, committee members would take it away and they'd be able to bring a motion at the next meeting or alternatively if it was a mat it would still always be a recommendation to regional council so you could bring a motion to regional council at the next meeting with notice but right now i i don't think it would be appropriate because we haven't had a chance to talk to staff about it we just got the presentation okay and then sean might want to do this anyway uh does that give us any does that give us enough time do we know because that's we're talking a couple of months now longer well, I, I don't know how quickly this i know uh, that there's a lot of staff on the call but I, my understanding is that yeah. it's tendered and and it's going to be under construction any day now that, that we've already tendered the project so perhaps uh if uh, uh mm -hmm. brad anguish is on the call he may want to uh, yeah. clarify where we're at thank you because there's no sense requesting staff reports and whatnot if this is going ahead and it's going to take us two months to get it uh, so i'd like that clarification thank you chair thank you very Sure. Um, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, the uh, contract is uh, tendered. The work is underway now. Um, we are on the other side of the street from George Daphne. I think we hit George Daphne in two weeks, uh, is my understanding. And uh, yeah, we're we're underway with the contract. So a uh, a stay per se will have uh, significant contract consequences that we would have to brief council on. Thank you. All right, thank you. And just one quick question for clarification to staff and Chair, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Brad, has, has Roddy's concerns been investigated by you or a member of your team? I think, look, just some context here. I'll just be careful how far I go with this, but look, there was a 13, I think it was a 1300, um, email FOIPOP or document FOIPOP. I think the key thing for council to understand is at any one point in time, as we work through uh, solutions that come forward to council, and by the way, this one has been to council on seven different occasions for approval, different forms. Um, you can go through any period of time as we bring these projects forward and find uh, that staff challenge each other to a significant degree. And so it's hard in a format like this to uh, basically deal with that specific question as always to me. But what I will say is if there were concerns uh, that were, we have to make trade-offs every day. It doesn't matter what, what job we're doing, what project we bring forward. And as you know, we bring forward hundreds a year. Um, there has to be uh, decisions made. If there was, a issue from the traffic authority that remained unaddressed, this project would not have proceeded. Thank you. And, and that's the assurance and the clarification I was looking for, Brad, and uh, and uh, way. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. And there are no further speakers on the list, so I thank the presenters for their time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move on now. That brings us back to the uh, uh, unamended agenda. We move to 8.1. Herring Cove Road Functional Plan, March 25th, 2021. And my understanding is there may be a updated staff presentation. And also I would ask the clerk, is the motion already on the floor? Did we, I believe we did that last time. So I don't think that needs to happen again after the presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have the revised presentation ready and I, I just need to double check the minutes from the last meeting to verify that the motion's on the floor. Okay, well, we'll go ahead with the updated presentation and uh, you can look that up while uh, Harrison is talking. Uh, Mr. McGrath, good to see you. You're still muted, sir. Well, Harrison struggles with the technology. Councillor Cuddle, did you want to speak now or did you want to wait until after the presentation? I'll wait till after the presentation. Perfect. Yep. And Harrison, you're unmuted. Can we hear you now? I think I'm good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Great, Excellent. perfect. All right, take her away. 
Perfect. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Harris McGrath. I'm a program engineer with transportation planning and planning and development. Um, today, we're, we're going to uh, I'll be presenting a revised presentation um, compared to the presentation that was brought to council uh, last month uh, around the Herring Cove Road project. Uh, next slide, please. So this this project was uh, kind of initiated with the adoption of the integrated mobility plan back in uh, December of 2017. Um, so the the integrated mobility plan is is our kind of master transportation and land use plan that directs um, directs our transportation projects throughout the municipality. Action 121 of the IMP calls for the development of strategic corridors. Um, so the, our strategic corridors are, are roadways with a lot of different competing priorities. Um, this involves regional traffic flow, transit, good, goods movement, and active transportation. So Herring Cove Road uh, definitely fits well within the strategic corridor designation as, as it has a, a lot of, um, it, it's, an, it's an important route for, for various modes of transportation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring attention to how many times or, or the various times that Herring Cove Road has been brought to uh, Regional Council for direction. So re relevant to this project, the first, uh, the Active Transportation Priorities Plan, which was approved back in July of 2014, um, recommended that a cycling infrastructure be added to Herring Cove Road. Um, the type was to be determined later. So that's that's one of the things that we've um, partially resolved through this project. Um, in 2017, the Integrated Mobility Plan identified the uh, the need to close some sidewalk gaps that um, were and, and still are on Herring Cove Road. So uh, one of the major gaps was uh, just south of Greystone Drive, which was completed last year. And we do have one remaining sidewalk gap between Glenora Road or Glenora Avenue and uh, Old Sambra Road. Um, the road is also uh, was brought back to council through the rapid transit strategy. The rapid transit strategy recommends that bus rapid transit is is added to Herring Cove Road. Um, so one of one of four routes within the municipality will, will be on Herring Cove Road. Um, that plan also recommended that transit lanes be added in, in uh, through through most of the corridor. Um, and we also brought forth uh, through the ICIP federal funding uh, report uh, a funding ask to to council for approval. Um, so that's that's fun federal funding that is allocated to green infrastructure projects. Uh, so the the active transportation, uh, outcomes of, of this project fit within that funding program. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the project objectives, um, Heron Cove Road, as, as I'll show in a later slide, um, has uh, the cross section and, and what the road looks like varies a fair amount. So one of the, one of the main goals was to provide a long-term corridor wide vision for Heron Cove Road. So that we have consistent infrastructure that, that doesn't have gaps in, in sidewalks and cycling infrastructure along the corridor um, to uh, identify and understand potential reconfiguration options and improve the quality and consistency for all transportation users. Um, evaluate all recommendations and changes through the pillars of the IMP and to complete the functional design design for the selected corridor. Um, that enables a strong understanding of the property requirements and construction costs. Uh, Heron Cove Road, the, uh, the right-of-way and available property varies a fair amount, um, and, and there's some very difficult topography, especially near the Armdale Roundabout, where we have some pretty serious slopes uh, and, and rock cuts, and uh, some retaining walls will be necessary. So we're really hoping to have a, a better understanding of what uh, would be required through that section especially. Uh, next slide, please. So this this project isn't as straightforward of, as some of our other projects. Um, really, we're, we're looking at three projects kind of combined. So back in 2019, we, we started a functional planning project. Um, so the, the goal of that plan was to come up with a 30% design 
Um, so that's the 30% is related to kind of the level of detail. So it's, it's more or less kind of an overhead 2D design, uh, doesn't really consider things like um, slopes and, and driveway tie-ins, but tells us what, what could be possible um, as far as, you know, how many traffic lanes are needed, um, where transit lanes and, and cycling lanes will fit. So we completed that project back in um, fall of 2019. Um, after that project was, was completed, the rapid transit strategy actually just started. <clears throat> so it, in the functional plan, um, it really was a, a very heavy active transportation uh, focused project with, with transit priority from Cowie Hill Road to the Armdale roundabout. But the rapid transit strategy actually recommended uh, a, a much higher level of transit priority through the corridor with, with transit lanes in both directions um, through, through much of the corridor. So the functional plan had to be updated to uh, include those, those changes. So after that, we had started a 60% design or preliminary design. And again, the 60% is referring to the level of detail. <clears throat> so in the 60% design, we're looking a lot more into kind of where retaining walls go, um, what properties may be impacted and, and to what degree, um, and, and more into utility impacts, um, a, a variety of things that just in, in more detail. So. Um, and sorry, so, so the map to the right, uh, the blue line shows the study area for the functional plan that was completed back in 2019. Um, the green dotted line, line at the top of the screen shows this phase one of the 60% design that we've completed and is included in this report. And uh, we have to do a, a future project that is expected to start this year, which will be phase two of the 60% design or preliminary design. Um, from Glenora to uh, the rest of the, the end of the, the corridor uh, near Greystone Drive. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the, the kind of cross-section and in infrastructure along Herring Cove Road uh, varies a fair amount through the corridor. Um, in the top left, uh, this is a section near the Armdale Roundabout, um, a very unique area of, of the city with the reversing lane. Um, sidewalks are, are narrow with one side being just asphalt um, and, and the other side being concrete. There's no cycling infrastructure and no transit priority. Um, just further out on, on Herring Cove Road, a little further south to the right of the screen is between Old Sambor Road and Glenora Avenue. So we have two lanes of traffic outbound and, and one lane inbound uh, for a total of three. We have concrete sidewalk on the left side and, and just a paved shoulder on the right side. So this is the area that, or the remaining area that is a, a significant sidewalk gap that you know, we, we should have sidewalk on both sides on this classification of road. Uh, there's a lot of traffic and, and also to connect bus stops. <clears throat> and the bottom left side of the screen is more within the commercial area, kind of the, the main street fail of Heron Cove Road, um, just north of Dentith Road. So here we have uh, five lanes of traffic, and that includes a, a center uh, two-way left turn lane. Um, there's sidewalk on both sides, but no dedicated cycling or, or transit infrastructure. And there has been some level of streetscaping done in the past with uh, added landscaping and trees and, and the, uh, the landscape boulevards uh, separating the sidewalk from the vehicle lanes. And then the final photo at uh, bottom right is um, just south of Sussex Street. Uh, so this is, is the widest section of Herring Cove Road. Um, again, five lane cross section with, with sidewalk on both sides, but uh, no dedicated cycling or, or transit infrastructure. And um, just south of this was, was where the sidewalk, sidewalk gap was actually completed last year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, part, of, part of the driver for completing this project is that Herring Cove Road has had uh, a fair amount of um, development recently and, and will continue to, to do so over the next coming years. So we've identified uh, the potential for 2,300 units to be developed along Herring Cove Road within the urban service boundary. Um, so uh, historically, transportation engineers would have would have um, seen the 2,300 units and focused on improving car, car carrying capacity. So, I mean, historically, I think dating as far back as the 1970s, there, 
we're plans to widen the entirety of Herring Cove Road to four lanes. Um, so this this would lead to induced demand as as it becomes easier to drive, more people do drive, and the uh, another key uh, issue with doing with increasing uh, traffic capacity here is that the Armdale roundabout is a significant bottleneck and is expected to continue to be a bottleneck in the future. So making it easier for people to get through Heron Cove Road, uh, you still kind of get to the queues at the roundabout in the morning peak hours and it, you're, you're kind of just getting to the queue quicker. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the, here's a, a clip of the rapid transit strategy yellow line. So as you can see, the the yellow line the yellow line is is the routing from uh, going from Greystone Drive into Mumford Terminal and continuing to downtown Halifax. The blue lines represent areas where there should be um, dedicated transit lanes. So inbound, we're looking at the entire section right to the Armdale roundabout, and outbound. Uh, the rapid transit strategy recommends beginning the open lane at, at Cowie Hill and uh, for the, the rest of the corridor. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this, this slide shows what was done in the uh, phase one of the preliminary design. So that's the most recent project we've completed. Um, so again, the preliminary design was was done to increase the level of detail and to have a better understanding of property impacts and, and cost estimates. Um, between the functional plan and preliminary design, there were uh, some design changes to active transportation infrastructure. So the original functional plan had a multi-use path between uh, the roundabout and Cowie Hill Road and then would transition to protected uh, unidirectional cycling lanes. Um, because of space requirements, we, we had to change that to a multi-use path for this entire section and expect that in phase two, we would uh, evaluate if unidirectional protected cyclings are, are possible beginning at Glenora. Um, so again, as I mentioned, this, this was done, uh, a big driving part of doing this project was to update this design to include the rapid transit strategy recommendations. Um, no vehicle lanes are removed through this section. And we had uh, two cost limits come in for uh, a couple different options, but which, which were uh, largely the same, but uh, the cost estimate was between 10.3 and 12.6 million for this section. Next slide, please. So phase two of the preliminary design will be the, the rest of the corridor. Um, we're expecting to issue an RFP uh, to have the consultant do that project sometime this year. Um, we will include public engagement for, for that section. So in phase two, we are expecting more design changes um, com compared to the functional design that we did in phase one. Um, so we, we will do a full public engagement um, in, in be showing concept designs to the public for input. Um, it is likely that vehicle lanes in, in at least some locations will be removed in favor of active transportation and transit infrastructure. And we will be also evaluating the multimodal capacity um, considering the as of right development, so that 2,300 uh, units that I mentioned before, and the potential for additional lands to come online that are currently included in holding zones and urban reserve. Next slide, please. So there, there are some funding opportunities for this project. Um, the federal government announced a $14.9 billion uh, funding program for public transit over the next eight years. Um, so this project, or this was mentioned a few years, or a few months ago, sorry. Uh, we're not sure how that money is being uh, distributed among municipalities, but we are expecting to get some funding through that program for implementation of the rapid transit strategy. As I mentioned before, in September, we brought forward the application for the ICIP funding, which was approved by Regional Council and has been submitted to the province. Um, one thing to note is that federal funding cannot be used to purchase land. Uh, we will need to purchase land for this project. So in order to kind of get our ducks in a row, we, we need to continue on with the design of this project, purchase the land in advance of construction so that we can uh, 
get the full benefit of that funding during construction. Uh, next slide, please. So the recommendations of this report um, are, is to endorse the functional plan and further integrate recommendations of the recently approved rapid transit strategy and to initiate efforts to acquire property to widen various sections of Herring Cove Road to accommodate dedicated active transportation and transit infrastructure. Next slide, please. So our next steps, if, if this uh, the recommendation is approved, we will issue the RFP for phase two of the preliminary design um, in the coming months, which is already included in the 2021-22 capital budget. And we will begin to program detailed design and land acquisition uh, and construction to be phased over the next five to 10 years. So this is a major construction project and, and won't take place all at once. Uh, so we will need to kind of plan schedule the work that needs to take place before that construction can begin. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you and here for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGrath. Was to Andrea, it's probably easier for you just to say rather than, oh, there you go. It was, so the motion is on the floor. It was moved by the deputy mayor and seconded by, uh, uh, Councillor Russell. So uh, we'll move to questions. Councillor uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, first of all, I just really want to thank Harrison and Tanya. Um, you know, my initial concerns, which led to my request to defer this, was um, just simply the amount of time provided between the release of this very large report, 600 page report full of technical detail um, and the report coming to committee. You know, it, it is a very complex project with many moving parts and many considerations um, as Harrison has just demonstrated. Um, and it's also been a very long time in the making to get to this point. And I, I, I just really felt it important that we had a presentation that could better explain to the public, to, to lay people, um, you know, kind of where we were coming from on this, where we are now and when we're going next. Um, you know, I, I, I myself had difficulty kind of deciphering all of that out of the, out of the initial report. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important in our communication that, that we present things so that, that the public has an opportunity to understand as well, so they can, they can comment appropriately on it. Um, you know, I feel this presentation has done an excellent job. Uh, so thank you, you know, thank you again, Harrison and Tanya for listening to my concerns, uh, having conversations with me and taking the time to, you know, to develop this, which I will believe, which I believe will go a long, long way um, towards helping the public better understand what, what's being proposed and what's being done. Um, there's just a few things I wanna emphasize here that I feel are really important. And one is that phase one, which is looking from um, Glenora to the Armdale roundabout, um, that phase one is going to 60% design, which you know looks at those things like you know the property acquisitions, um, looking at how to accommodate bus lanes and cycling lanes, and that no traffic lanes are going to be removed. So I think that's really important piece. And that the second, the second part of all of this is phase two, which looks from Glenora up to um, Greystone area. And um, in that phase two, we are really, there's gonna be more opportunity for public engagement, conceptual designs will be presented and um, and so the public will be further engaged and consulted on this. Um, I do feel that we that we need to move ahead on this. There's funding opportunities. Uh, Herring Cove Road really needs some work done on it um, throughout the whole thing, but particularly the Glenora to the, the roundabout section is in need of real repair and all those sidewalk gaps and all the rest of it. So um, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the recommendation on the table. Um, by staff and hope we can move forward. And thank you again, uh, Harrison and Tanya. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Is there anyone further who'd like to speak? 
uh, you know, for my part, I just asked staff, I think I want to, uh, I think I hinted at this last time, but I haven't, uh, I don't think I asked it as a question is, uh, I'm a little concerned about the timeline pushing this out four or five years, as I said, in budget and, and at council. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, if we have the uh, detailed design for phase one and we're moving into that design for phase two or the next sections of consultation and design for phase two, uh, can this be moved? We're, we're going to move and stuff to the right right now. Could we move it to the left? I, you know, I don't want to see this be uh, four or five years before this gets done. Uh, I'd like to see it done as soon as possible, especially given the federal funding that is available for everything but the land purchases, Harrison said. So uh, I see uh, Tanya Davis at, on the screen. So uh, take it away, Ms. Davis. So through you, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, we have it programmed in the capital budget as as Mary kind of laid out and as we've been talking over the last uh, few years with with councils we, we work through functional planning and then preliminary design detail design and into construction so that's usually a four-year process so um and then when land is there it, it further complicates the timing on things so i think and, and we just we just laid out the capital budget with the budget allocations we have so I think what will come into play is whether we get some, some funding assistance from our other levels of government um, and whether we can kind of slide this to the left or the right. But we're certainly, from a staff perspective, we're certainly looking to, to advance this work uh, um, as fast as we can. But understanding that, you know, we have capital budget pressures as well as um, um, process that we have to go through. So respecting the process, you know, it is four years. I recognize that from initial concept to, you know, design, design, build. Um, but we're we're through those first two or three years now, right? Like, our, our, you know, we've got final design and then build, hopefully. So recognizing that funding seems to be the main process, I'll just put a stake in the ground right now and say, uh, for these three critical ones, Portland Street, Herring Cove, and Bedford Highway, I would just borrow the money and do them even if the feds don't come through, because I don't see how we can be a 600,000 person city in 15 years if we don't do them. Like not, not a city anybody on this call wants to live in anyway. So with that in mind, I, I support the motion and I'll, I'll stop, you know, like we can't answer this today in Transportation Standing Committee, but I, oh, I see Councillor Edits is now on the list, but I, I do think what that when uh, when Ms. Fraser, the CFO, brings forward her strategic capital plan, the council has to be thinking about how we can create larger budgets for these three uh, projects that happen sooner rather than three and four and five years out. So uh, thank you very much for that. And we'll go to Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you. And I, I want to support your comments on it would be nice to see this particularly. And, and Tanya, you touched on this as well. It'd be certainly nice to see these move along faster if uh, we got some uh, support from other levels of government. Um, very practical level concern that I have, Tanya, is, and I'll ask this about the Bedford Highway as well as Herring Cove, because Patty mentioned this as well. We've got areas right now that are almost impassable, uh, potholes and bad sidewalks and bad gutters and curbs and whatnot. How, if this does get pushed out several years while we do more planning, await federal funding and our share of the federal funding, are you working with Dave Hubley's group and others closely because we're in a situation where we don't want to, you know, people understand, I think, while well, we don't spend a whole lot of money fixing the uh, uh, Cogswell interchange right now to turn around and tear it down. Uh, but I am very concerned about Harry Cove Road and the Bedford Highway. How are we going to extend the life of what's there now while trying to plan and, and get the funding for what the, the vision that you presented today and, of course, previously had for Bedford Highway? So can you ask, can you give me a little comment? And I know it's a little bit out of your your uh, wheelhouse there because Dave's not with us, but I, a lot of people are getting really frustrated with the present conditions. And if we say, well, four or five years from now, you should see what we're going to build, you know, uh, doesn't buy us a whole lot of capital, no pun intended. Sure. Great question uh, to you, Mr. Chair, to the Deputy Mayor. Um, we are working, we work very closely with TPW on figuring out the strategies to, to try and go through these. These corridors are long. As you know, the Bedford Highway is 12 kilometers. Uh, Herring Cove is a long corridor as well as Portland Street. We can't do all the construction in one year. These are several years of construction to get them done. So we do need to work uh, closely with that thread and, and the Hubley's team to figure out what the mitigation is to hold. So not to invest too much, but to invest enough to hold it so that it's possible and, and it works for the people that need to use it in the environment that we get there. 
So, um, for instance, for Herring Cove, um, that has been one of the, the most recent discussions that we've been having. So we'll, we'll see those mitigation plans put into place. You're muted, uh, Count Deputy Mayor. And, and maybe it's happy. I mean, we all meet with Dave and Ed, but whether Catherine, who has more of the Bedford Highway than I do, and Patty, of course, with uh, if they're having those discussions with you and, and um, Dave regularly, because I think we're going to have to start communicating to that to people that there is a plan and this is what's going to happen and why. I think most people understand you don't rebuild something and then tear it down. But as I say, four or five years with third world conditions are not going to go over too well either. But anyway, that's for you and Patty and Catherine to talk about, I guess. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, there are no further speakers uh, on the list. The motion is on the floor. Uh, would someone care to call the question? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor? Aye. Good. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, staff. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, so that we'll move now to uh, item nine, table matters. There are none. 10, correspondence, petitions, and delegations, 10.1. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, do we have, uh, could you outline the correspondence we've received? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, the committee received correspondence for item 8.1 and item 10.3.2, and that correspondence was circulated to the committee before the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any petitions, Madam Clerk? Uh, the clerk's office has not received any uh, petitions. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, are there any petitions? Seeing none, move to item. Uh, we've uh, completed item 10.3.1 and 10.3.2 at the start of the meeting. So we now go to information items brought forward. There are none. Staff reports 12.1.1. It's the most joyful. Oh, welcome aboard, Councillor and Vice Chair Kent. Perfect. Uh, it's the most wonderful time of the quarter, 12.1.1, Halifax Transit, uh, quarter three KPI reports. Trisha Hughes, tell us how COVID's going Thank for you. you. Thank you, Chair. Trisha Hughes, uh, Director of Planning and Customer Engagement at Halifax Transit. I'll just share my screen here. Uh, so I have for you today the Q3 report. Uh, so just as a, a reminder, Q3 means October, November, and December of 2020-21. Uh, and if you recall at that time that the case numbers were relatively low in October, but started to really uptick again by the end of November uh, with a lot of people uh, working from home in late November and December if they could. So running through a few of the, the highlights, uh, as always, we have three transportation priority outcomes that we were reporting on for this fiscal year. Uh, and, I, and I'll go through uh, the major deliverables under each of those. So under a safe and accessible transportation network, we had four. Uh, two of those were in progress and on track, which was the bus stop accessibility and improvement program. Uh, that's where we upgrade uh, landing pads and, and bus stops annually and the fare management project. Uh, two projects were behind schedule, which was the access bus continuous service plan and the fixed route planning schedule and operations software. So just a few highlights, the, the technology projects make up the large part of this deliverable or this uh, priority outcome area. The fixture planning, scheduling and operation software project, uh, there's, it's a very complex solution. It requires a tremendous amount of testing, but there was significant progress made on the testing uh, in recent months. The fair management project, we're very excited uh, to be able to say that the RFP for a mobile ticketing solution was released earlier this week. Uh, getting a bit of uh, interest and in, in media pickup in that and it's something we're definitely looking forward to. And paratransit, which uh, we've discussed at this committee before, the mobile data terminals, uh, we're continuing to work with the vendor planning that solution and making good progress there. Second priority outcome area, interconnected and strategic growth. There are four business plan deliverables. Uh, so if you'll rem remember, this was for last year, uh, last fiscal year, and Bears Road and Young and Young Street and Roby Street, the work we intended to do that year was all complete uh, as planned. Now we're looking forward to this year's construction uh, through other discussions on the agenda, but last year we had completed the deliverables related to those. Uh, West Bedford Park and Ride design is complete, 
and the Wright Lake Transit Center expansion uh, has been a bit delayed uh, as it relates to the electric bus pilot project, which is still in progress. So a little bit more detail on a few of those. We did complete stakeholder engagement and finish the detailed design for the West Bedford Park and Ride in Q4 of 2020 and 2021. And the Earthworks tender has just been issued uh, to complete the site prep. So that one's happening in, in two parts. The first part is the earthwork, uh, clearing, rubbing, leveling the site, and then the construction will happen in a second tender. So this one's on track for construction in summer and fall of this year. The conceptual planning and analysis uh, for the Ragged Lake Transit Center expansion was ongoing through Q3, and the tender's now ready for the design work. Uh, just in anticipation of hopefully future funding for a battery electric bus project, we're, we're getting as prepared as we possibly can be. Uh, we have the RFP documents ready to go for, for the buses and uh, charging infrastructure. And we've also been working on a charger optimization study um, to identify the optimal, optimal number of chargers required and develop accurate power demand profiles. So work ongoing there so that we'll be, we'll be ready to go. A well-maintained transportation network, really just one uh, deliverable under that category last year, which was the Woodside Ferry Terminal. So as you may recall, phase one of construction was the uh, replacement of the elevator, the uh, one smaller elevator with two new larger elevators. That was complete last summer. Uh, phase two construction really kicked off in October and is continuing. So I'd like to thank all of the passengers for, for hanging in there. I know it's challenging to be uh, commuting through a construction area, um, but we're really looking forward to to the completion of that project in a much better facility for passengers. Some highlights of our key performance measures, overall boardings were down uh, 40% compared to the year before, revenue was down 43.5%. Uh, despite this, I mean, that still results in almost 52,000 people traveling or 52,000 boardings on uh, on weekdays. 33,000 on Saturdays and close to and 23,000 on Sundays. So system-wide on-time performance was 87%. That was an improvement of 8% over the year before, uh, largely due to lower traffic volumes, I would say. Uh, the departures line received over 2,000 calls a day on a typical weekday. Excessive bus was operating 10% fewer trips compared to the year before. And 95% of customer feedback was resolved within service standards. The last slide, uh, average fuel cost was three cents higher than we expected at 52 cents a liter. Uh, the mean distance between service calls for our, our transit fleet department was improved by 16%, but the mean distance between failures was decreased by 17%. So good news, bad news there. Um, the mean distance between service calls for excessive bus was 67,801 kilometers. The maximum daily number of buses that couldn't complete their, their routes due to a mechanical defect was 20, while the daily average was 6.4, and maintenance cost was $1.24 a kilometer, which is one cent higher than what we had budgeted for. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hughes. Are there any questions from the committee? We'll go to Council Russell. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for, for the report. This is one of the ones that, uh, that I look forward to regularly um, because we are trying to uh, improve ridership, um, increase ridership, uh, make sure that uh, more people are using the bus system. And this is a system that we need to encourage people to use, uh, that we need to make sure is, is better for people to use. We can't just force them to use it because uh, then although they might use it, they won't appreciate it and we will see the begrudging works and, and, and that would just be no good. Um, we have an on-time performance rate. This is one of the key things that I look for uh, in, in every one of these reports, because if the bus service is reliable from the perspective of getting places on time, people will be able to trust it and they will be, um, and they'll be able to plan their day. Uh, if they have to transfer, they will be able to do that and know with a high degree of certainty. Uh, that it will work. So if the buses are too early or too late, and and I'm, I'm doing the broken record thing here, you've heard me talk about it a million times before. 
We just need to uh, keep an eye on it. And, and this year, th- this quarter, uh, it has improved. It has gone up uh, into the range of 85 to 90%. And I, I appreciate that. There are still some uh, routes that it is down a little bit, but, but that's, they, they aren't, uh, well, they're, they're better than they were. But we're in the middle of COVID. And there are fewer cars, and there are fewer people, and there are, there are fewer delays. And I'm wondering if there is anticipation about what the uh, on-time rate might be uh, once we get past uh, COVID, and um, what sort of mitigation strategies might we learn from now, or might we have been able to learn over the past couple of years to make sure that we continue a high on-time rate Ms. Hughes. Sure, thank you. And it's a really great topic. Um, and I guess a topic I find interesting as well. I think what we've seen uh, in past years is we did have routes that had static schedules for many, many years that didn't account for increased congestion. Uh, we also didn't have uh, a great deal of schedule adherence data. So as we've done the Moving Forward Together plan, we have certainly used better data to create the run times and create the schedules. So we have seen a bit of a trend where the routes that had been redesigned or relaunched through the Moving Forward Together plan did tend to have slightly better scheduled adherence than those that haven't been touched yet. Um, so I, I and the other part of that is um, we were following up a year later to, to tweak and refine and fine tune. Um, so I do expect that as we continue with the rollout of the plan, the overall uh, on time performance number will continue to increase as we as we. Uh, look at routes like the Route 1, uh, which we haven't touched yet, uh, that, you know, is, is a struggle for on top performance because it travels through a lot of congested areas. Um, so it's, it's really two-pronged, I think, in terms of mitigation. It's reviewing the data, looking at where congestion levels have changed, which can be increased or decreased, uh, and, and refining and fine-tuning now that we have the data available. Uh, and the other part is you know, what the work we're doing with our partners in TPW and planning and development and finding ways to get the buses out of that congestion and the transit priority lanes. And, you know, the the time savings with transit priority measures is really important, but the reliability uh, is perhaps more so because it gives us that consistent travel time that we can schedule the routes for. Uh, So it's really a two-pronged approach at this point. Um, And I would say that, you know, uh, the... Before COVID, I think we were sitting in the, the high 70 percentages, uh, kind of off the top of my head. So I do expect it to the, the on-time performance to go down slightly as traffic increases, for, for sure, as the councillor mentioned. Okay. I don't know how my time is. So you're definitely over time, but there's nobody else on the list. So I would be inclined to give you a follow-up question out of or kindness. Two. Or two. I appreciate that. If you can keep Thank it you. 60 Thank seconds, you can do 10, but... Go, go, go. Wonderful. So my two follow-up questions. I'm looking at page 20 of the report and it talks about passenger overloads and it shows that they're all in the regional center. We have talked a number of times about the park and ride out here at the Sackville terminal and how that's used to um, receive people generally from points beyond uh, Windsor, Kentville area. Um, so it surprises me that uh, there are no loads in, especially that, but also potentially Cobbequid. That could be a COVID impact, I'm not sure. Um, if you could respond to that, that's question one. Question two gets down to the uh, battery electric buses uh, that you had talked about. I was pleased to see that on the report, uh, pleased to see that the RFP was going out. How many buses are we looking at? Sure. Uh through the chair to the councillor, the uh, overloads, we don't typically see them at Sackville Terminal and Cobbwood Terminal. Um, there's a great deal of service at Sackville Terminal and we do hear from passengers from time to time that uh, would like extra service because they're standees. So typically those express routes that are traveling from Sackville and Cobbwood only have a small limited number of, uh, of standees. There are, have been in the past uh, a few instances where we, you know, historically had added double header buses. So there used to be two number 84s that left at the same time from Cobblewood to accommodate the volumes. Um, but I would say those commuter crowds are a lot more predictable um, and have grown, the service has grown in the past years with the demand. Uh, 
which isn't necessarily the case in the regional center when people are using the bus for a variety of purposes, going all different directions, not doing the same thing every day. So yeah, we don't we don't have many overloads at all uh, in this actual area. Um, and to your second question, the the intent, and I think that uh, my colleague, the director of transit fleet is, is on the call. Um, I believe the intent is that the first phase of the battery electric bus project uh, would it be up to 60 vehicles uh, to get us started? I don't know, Bill, if you want to confirm that. Oh, uh, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Mr. Cutler. Still nothing. Okay, I will answer for him as 60 vehicles. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> that would be in, in line with last uh, last May's staff report to regional council that the, the first phase would be well, uh, somewhere uh, 60. That is uh, absolutely I, fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for all of the information. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. There's no further speakers. I'll, I will just say, first of all, that William Cutler brings the science and it's too bad his mic didn't work uh, and, and that's disappointing. And two, I would have bet money that it was gonna be 20 or less EV buses. So I think you saw the look on uh, Councilor Russell's in my face. I think we're all very pleased to hear 60 is really the opening uh, ante. So that's great. So thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Outhit, do you have uh, uh, anything you'd like to say? No. Nope. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, there's no further questions, so we'll move on in our agenda. So the next thing on our agenda is to backtrack to the very beginning. And uh, now that Councillor Mancini's here, Mancini's here, we can actually have the discussion about, uh, uh, have a motion, uh, uh, we have a motion from, or a request from Councillor Kent to add 15.1 proposed amendments to HRM bylaw T1000 to the agenda, which requires unanimous consent. So uh, Councillor Man Mancini, you're the one who we hadn't received an email from, uh, no pressure, but is that all right with you? Well, the power placed upon me, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Kent, um, uh, that's uh, a week's worth of coffee, free coffee cards. Uh, yeah, let me see. Of course, uh, I have no problem with that, Mr. Chair, to add this to the agenda. Thank you very much. So with that unanimous consent, we will add as 15.1 proposed amendments to HRM bylaw T1000, which will be debated after uh, we uh, uh, get through the next couple items. Uh, we have no report from the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. We have uh, no motions from members of the Transportation Standing Committee, which brings us to 13.1, my motion regarding uh, protected turning movements and pedestrian safety. I'd ask uh, Vice Chair Kent to take over at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to do that. So with that, Councillor Mason, would you like to put 13.1 on the floor? Why, yes, I would. Thank you for asking. So I will move the Transportation Standing Committee request a staff report to be completed prior to the start of the 2022-23 budget discussion that outlines options for program to establish protected left turn movements and protected right turn movements at signal controlled intersections. The program should prioritize high traffic and pedestrian volume intersections and high conflict intersections. I so move. Look at my man seating. Okay, we have a mover and seconder. Councillor Mason, would you like to... I would. Thank, thank you very much, Vice Chair Kent. So uh, thank you, committee, uh, for, uh, you know, entertaining this motion. Uh, why is it written this way? We've had, I've, I've certainly gotten some feedback, including from Mr. Williams, uh, who presented earlier today, that the time frame is too long and that it's not directive enough. And, and so the intention here is twofold. One is to uh, uh, get to a point with staff where, where this committee is saying, we are okay with really moving forward with protected right and left turns. And what protected right and left turns mean where you have to wait for an arrow saying you're allowed to go left or right uh, at more and more busy intersections, it will protect pedestrians because it means pedestrians will only have the uh, the, the walk uh, signal uh, when uh, someone doing a right or left turn does not have a signal, has a red light and is not allowed to proceed legally. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the big thing here is that uh, it will slow down traffic. Uh, and I don't mean slow down traffic like cars will go more slowly. I mean, travel time will go up. 
that we will have longer queues. And the example that I, I like to use is uh, Oxford and Jubilee is a, a very dangerous intersection in District 7. And uh, that intersection has a crossing guard who is routinely in contact with me about how uh, there's near misses every week with kids crossing going down to uh, Tupper, going up to Halifax Central and going to La Marche and St. Thomas for French. And, um, uh, you know, if we put a uh, uh, no right turn on red, if we uh, put uh, on all legs, because one leg does have a left turn uh, arrow, uh, uh, a, a control uh, for the left turn, uh, that would slow down traffic tremendously. You would see a lot of cars stopped waiting to get permission to turn right or turn left, depending on how it ends up going on Oxford and Jubilee. That's okay. I think we need to tell staff councils willing to take that if it means that we stop having near misses and potentially accidents like we've been seeing, like the one that did trigger this, which was uh, Dr. Gast being hit, uh, my neighbor being hit at the corner of Kemp and, uh, and Young uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is if we want to do, uh, you know, support staff in the good work they've been doing on moving toward vision zero uh, by saying, yeah, not only are we okay with uh, slowing down traffic and making trip travel times longer, uh, but we are willing to pay for it. So that's why it says, uh, let's uh, uh, have this report for budget because saying what I would like to see is five or 10 intersections a year identified for this work. And it's gonna take new signals, it's gonna take maybe new controllers, and it's gonna possibly take widening the road. And all of that is money. And it's not small money, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this right in some cases. And I think this council is willing to do that. And so, so we need to know what it's going to cost. We need to know what the options are, and we need to tell them that this is something we want to pursue. So, I ask for this committee's support so that we can get that ball rolling, and we can have that debate during the next uh, budget meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Mason. I don't see any other notices. Oh, there's Councillor Oathead. Would you like an opportunity to speak? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and I certainly will be supporting this. And I think uh, my concerns going into this, was, as well as what I supported, my concerns have been addressed by uh, by way outlining the <clears throat> the costs and uh, how many would might be a year and the priority given and this sort of thing. The only thing that scares me, and I said this during the IMP as well, and I'll get criticized for saying this, but sometimes the more you slow down traffic, the more road rage you cause, and the more you end up sometimes getting the uh, the opposite effect with a bunch of impatient drivers. But uh, we have to try and do the right thing and make our crosswalks and pedestrians safer. But uh, it's gonna be an interesting uh, balancing act and of course expensive and probably more important in in the area urban areas than some of the uh, rural and suburban but i certainly uh, i'm really anxious to see this this report back though i'd like to see these this discussion so thank you way for bringing this forward and thank you madam chair thank you councillor um seeing no other questions i just want to ask is it in order that i can actually comment or do i have to can I... I monitor? I think it's just so. a comment. Yeah. Um, so I, I appreciate that this is being brought forward as well. I uh, consistently, as Wei has expressed, and I know don't, that many of their counselors who are not members of this committee have experienced is a, a, a very serious concern around um, near misses. Uh, a year ago, we lost a, a loved one of uh, one of my residents and uh, in the similar situation. And I know that I'm, I want to say out loud that I'm, I, Apologize for missing the um, presentation from Martin and um, Lena. I I want I, I was interested and I just could not. Um, I had to kind of choose and and I was grateful to have some opportunities to discuss this in the past with some of you folks. So I I'm happy this is for, coming forward and um, I look forward to seeing your report. Thank you. And one last call for anyone. Otherwise, would, would you like to go to the question? Question. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion's carried. Thank Mr. You Chair, I'd like to take the chair again. I would. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, colleagues, for that. So that brings us to item 14 in camera in private items. There are none. And so now we move to the most recently, it's so recently added that it's still warm from the oven, 15.1. Proposed amendments to HRM bylaw T1000, 
we'll go to Vice Chair Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to put this motion on the floor that uh, the Transportation Standing Committee request a staff report to amend HRM bylaw T-1000 to ensure fairness in the process to become either a taxi driver or a transportation network company or TNC driver. So moved. I moved by second. Councillor Kent. Seconded by? I will second that, Councillor Russell. Oh. I oh. think Councillor Stoddard did it first. Oh, Councillor Stoddard did it first. I, I, think, I think I heard her in there. So I'll, I'm gonna go with yeah. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks as well to everyone on the committee for being patient and coordinating around um, my absence and uh, and uh, not hearing from Councillor Mancini. Councillor Mancini, you're my hero today. Um, so to, to uh, I, I I really I really am pleased, quite pleased to put this forward. I have a lot of taxi drivers that have reached out to me, uh, in particular earlier in the stages when we were considering the the. Uh, um, um, motions that were before us for the TNC service. And um, I think there were some legitimate fears and there, the, what we've recently, I think you all have received a copy of a letter that came from Casino Taxi. And I think that articulated um, some of the areas that I had concerns around as well and were articulated to me earlier. The main thing is that we, I, I think unintended consequences sometimes happen when we bring big shifts like this in. And um, it's, I, I think there is a, a certainly uh, an unfair field for the industry around transpo singular transportation like this. The, um, the, the process whereby the TNC drivers have no license and no process and no financial obligations to, to become part of the industry, uh, yet the taxi drivers who have served this municipality and many around the province and, and certainly um, done a great service for the communities that we live in and represent, uh, they are still um, hands, hands stay, stay, I guess, I don't even know the word, sorry. They are stuck in this process that uh, is cumbersome, is prohibitive, is slow, is financially challenging. And the most recent situation is there's an attraction for taxi drivers to say, I don't want to deal with that anymore. I'm going to go to the one that's easy. I'm going to go to the one that's no license. I'm going to go to the one that <laughs> doesn't cost me any money. We also have some challenges around the um, conditional licenses that our taxi drivers are having to, to uh, deal with. And they're creating further barrier, barriers um, and, and again, motivation to potentially give up on that industry. I think it's a combination uh, the, the, the you know singular kind of tra transportation that we're talking about is still vital to our residents that we serve and the um, and our communities and the businesses that we have uh, that ha are benefiting from these kinds of uh, uh, destinations and it, it's incumbent on us I think to to work out a solution so we don't inhibit and lose potentially a really good service that would not be our original intention. So with that, I would like to suggest that, or I'm interested in creating a staff report that would be create a, a, a comparable process for each type of taxi or TNC driver, driver situation, similarly to those uh, at play for taxi licenses or creating efficiencies in that one and creating efficiencies in that one, because I think there's some problems with it. I'd like to eliminate the to look at eliminating the conditional license period for all drivers for hire. Currently, only taxi licenses have this, uh, where the TNC have no requirement for license, let, let alone the conditional license period. It, um, potentially eliminate the taxi driver national certification program or include it as a TNC licensing. Um, so information on that would be helpful. Eliminate winter driving courses for taxi drivers or include it for the requirement for TNC drivers. Obviously, um, I think in the beginning of when when these these all these conditions for the taxi drivers came into play, there may very well have been a lot of, of strong reasons for that. But um, it's I think it's time to re revisit it and and again create a, a fair playing field. So I'll leave it there, and I look forward to hearing from any other councillors that might have something to offer. Thank you, Vice Chair. We'll move to Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Council, for putting this on the floor. You said I was your hero. 
You may not say that after my comments I'm about to okay. share. With you, but, uh, uh, I support the motion. I have no problem making it fair. Let's and I have many uh, taxi drivers in my district also. But let's let's be crystal clear why TNC is in our community now, because the taxi service was inadequate. It was broken, and ca uh, residents from my district and all of our districts, especially yours, uh, accounts for Kent. Can couldn't get cab drive, cabs. Now, is that the fault of the drivers? No, it's the fault of the system. And the system was broken. So TNC was brought here. I have not received any complaints about trying to get a, uh, a ride to and from downtown now. Of course, the pandemic has played a role in all that too. There's not as many people, but you know, especially for our youth uh, going out there and trying to find cabs. So I just want to be clear on that. Uh, you know, I, I respect what you're trying to do and we should make it as fair as possible. However, let's not uh, raise the flag too high and saying the uh, old poor cab drivers because there was a mess and the TNC is helping to add to, to fix that. So I just want to make that uh, clear. I support your motion. We should try to make it fair. I agree with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Never controversial. Uh, moving now to uh, Councillor Russell with the uh, gold star for the best science fiction reference today regarding the Terminator motion, T-1000. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, let's see what happens on Tuesday. Uh, so, so one of the interesting things about this is uh, your point number four, and I appreciate that uh, in the outcome slot, eliminate winter driving course. Um, there's a huge difference between a taxi driver and a TNC driver. A taxi driver is scheduled. Uh, they know where they're going. You know who you're getting. Um, they know what the conditions are. Uh, we are able to rate them. Uh, we, uh, there are a number of inherent controls. If we're assuming Uber and, and services like that, of course, uh, TNC has to be more broad than, than Uber. But um, with a taxi, on the other hand, there's a car sitting on the side of the road. I get in the car and we go to an unknown location. Uh, so I don't know the driver. Driver doesn't know the passenger. Don't know the location. It, it's not unregulated. It is indeterminate, I, I think is, is the better term. So there, I, I agree with the motion. I, I think the motion makes a huge amount of sense. I want to make sure that we still have a high degree, a higher degree of rigor for the taxi drivers than we have for the uh, TNC drivers because of that indeterminate nature of a taxi driver. Um, over in England, uh, I was there, oh gosh, 40 years ago or something. And they had a number of taxis that were able to drive. Um, and you call them up and they say, yeah, we will be sending this driver to your house. And they make sure that they know exactly where you're going and um, where you're coming from so that the driver has the opportunity to look that up in their system and make sure that they have an understanding of the route and all of the processes. And you have to do that for something like 12 years before you're able to drive one of the famous London cabs. And the London cabs are able to pull over and just pick people up and, and go. Um, and, and the reason for the difference is because you have to establish that the taxi driver has that certain degree of core competency. I want to make sure that we don't lose that in what we're trying to do here. Yes, there can be changes made. It can be reviewed. Let's uh, let make sure that they still provide the ample protection that is required. It, this motion uh, does miss one thing that uh, that I have heard about both before the TNC rules came in and and after, and that is in relation to the fares for uh, taxi brokers. So uh, TNC companies um, have to pay a sliding scale of, of fees to HRM based on uh, how big they are. If you have five cars, you pay a small amount. If you have 100 cars, you pay a much larger amount. Um, taxi brokers, uh, companies like Yellow Cab or the individual owner operators uh, have to pay the same amount. If you have one car or if you have 500 cars, you pay $200, I think it is per year. I'm wondering if it would be uh, a friendly amendment to add the broker fee uh, for consideration to this motion. So that we look to see, uh, you know, for taxi brokers who have one car, they would pay a different fee and still establish a sliding scale perhaps, um, but they would pay a different fee than a company that has 500 cars. And I, I'm not sure about the wording, 
Um, but I'm wondering if, if that would be something that would be in consideration uh, for this motion. If it is, I would like to move that as friendly amendment, whatever the heck the wording is. I think we definitely need some wording to, to know <laughs> with all due respect, Councillor Russell. So how about we go for a general feel from uh, 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 Councillor Kent while you try and type something into the chat there. Uh, Absolutely, Kent, thank you. Thoughts? Certainly, I, I, I'm open to that consideration, but in keeping with the spirit of this motion, this is around creating it for both, something that's fair and equitable for both TNC and taxi. So. Assuming that your uh, um, consideration of that kind of, of change would also be applied, potentially applied in the staff report coming back on potentially applying that as well to a licensing and process for the TNC, then I'm open to that as a friendly amendment. And I think the clerk could tell us, sorry, the uh, legal can tell us whether or not it's in fact creating a, an opportunity for a friendly amendment. It seems friendly to me, but I'm a friendly person. <laughs> Who uh, seconded the motion was Mancini. So is that all right with you, Tony? Oh, I didn't second the motion. The main motion? Who I didn't seconded hear it? The main motion was Iona. Uh, Iona. Oh, Councillor Stoddard, right. Councillor Stoddard, is that friendly to you? I'm friendly like Councillor Kent. I would I would go along with whatever she decided. So if there's uh, no objection, we will consider that amended. Well, we have a question about it, though. Okay, yeah, well, then I, that's I, an objection. Wanna, We're going to debate it and vote on it. All right, that's I, fine, too. Like this, I think it's supposed to come up here in the chat. Is it not? We haven't yeah, seen Paul it. just shared it. As well as to examine the fee structure for taxi brokers. He's just adding that to the end. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I, yeah, so again, taxi brokers and TNC brokers would be okay with me. I'm not okay with it just examining it for one. I think that's that's not friendly and that's not friendly and from the, the, the you know the, the concept of this motion is that we're looking at both fairly and maybe creating a system that works. I just saw the, the classic work. hand signal from Councillor Russell that that indicates that he would be okay with it saying the fee structure for taxi and TNC brokers. Is that correct, Councillor Russell? Yes, I'm fine with that. However, uh, the TNCs are already on a sliding scale. And right. one of the well, differences that's, that's... is that the taxi brokers are not. Um, so this would be the this would be the disparity that this motion would hope to correct. But if it is the fee structure for TNCs, as well as for taxi brokers? Sure. Well, that's why we get a staff report, right? That'll provide the clarity. That's right. right? Sure. And I think the concern was, as I recall, because we have a couple of new folks on this, was that the, uh, the TNCs are all uh, web-based, data-based companies where a taxi broker isn't, hasn't historically always been, but they have to be now to be able to maintain the uh, reporting standards we now require, right? So, uh, you know, it's unlikely that someone is going to be their own broker now because the cost is going to be too high. The technical requirements are too high. But yeah. um, so with that, uh, uh, so the amendment would then read, as well as to examine the fee structure for taxi and TNC brokers. Yes. And that's friendly to Councillor Kent and to Councillor Stoddard. Is there any objection to that being included for the staff report? If, if I may, uh, we have taxi oh, no. brokers. <laughs> just moving one word nope. we have taxi brokers and we have tnc's we don't have well, tnc brokers taxi brokers and tnc's that's taxi even better brokers and tnc's yeah. so so do you have that andrea for the record uh yes mr chair we have a question from councillor mancini no it was a comment and you addressed it uh, I, I was just going to go back to the conversation we had about the brokers and, and working online it's a web-based program and so you, you address it, thanks. To provide safety to passengers, we want data that has not, for you know, in the past been required. So, uh, so that's the only question. It is friendly. We will now consider that amended. We will move back to the main motion. And next in the main motion was Deputy Mayor Outis. Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. And I will support this um, request. I do have some real concerns about this, based on 
what we went through the last few years with taxis and setting up TNCs and, and uh, whatnot. I remember those third surveys with thousands of people and how unhappy they were with the taxi industry. So I'm supporting Tony's comments here. So fairness is, is, is a, a good objective and I'll support that. Whether they are exactly the two ser same ident identical services or not is going to be an interesting debate. But I would have real concerns about us lowering bars <laughs> in order to achieve fairness versus trying to find ways to raise bars. And I think, um, you know, having been around when we went through all these surveys, and I wish Andrea and Hillary were here to, to talk about this, but what we went through and the debating, the debating we did about this, making changes to the taxi industry and then allowing TNCs. And I think at the time, and I still feel that way, to some extent, we capitulated to the TNCs to want them here because, well, we, you know, we won't come if there's too many barriers. We won't come if uh, this type of license, uh, we won't come. And then we had the public saying they were unhappy, couldn't get home at night. And, you know, 80, and I can remember hearing from so many people, we will never be a real true big city until we have a stadium and TNCs, to which I say baloney to both. But um, there's a reason why this happened the way, the way it did. Uh, and I think we're glad that uh, that TNCs are here. But yeah. if there's a risk of lowering the bar, lowering the standards at a time, and a lot of us have mothers and wives and daughters and whatnot who we worry very much about using services, we want the drivers to be screened well, trained well, evaluated well uh, of both TNC and cabs. Um, I, I'm really going to struggle with this. However, uh, I'll support this. I look forward to it. I, the last thing I'd probably want to do is reopen the whole taxi debate again. I think I'd probably rather talk about chickens and cats some days, but, uh, but I guess we, we have to, and the fairness is, is an objective that I will certainly support, but we have to make sure, first of all, they're equal, and I really would have a problem with lowering standards when I feel that we may have capitulated or dropped the standards too much to allow the TNCs to come. So, in, in, you know, in response to, I would say, some lobbying from the industry and also you know, public demand wanting it. Anyway, my two cents, I'll support this, but uh, you've heard my concerns. Thanks, hey, George. Deputy, Deputy Mayor, your discussion, your wish to discuss chickens, that's coming soon. So hang in there, my friend. Well, it's, uh, I, I know it's been a long day on day two of lockdown, but let's try and get back to actually following the speaker's list. Man, Jeannie. Uh, uh, no one else is on the list to speak. Uh, Councillor Stoddard, if you can chime in anytime, if you wish. I'll just speak briefly and say I am, you know, this motion uh, is in response to a concern from an industry uh, leader in Halifax. And, and to me, not everything that could be uh, made the same as a TNC should be. Uh, but I do think that one of the biggest things I read in the letter was around training. Uh, right now, HRM staff have to do the training and there is a bottleneck on that. But with a TNC, they're, they're doing an online survey effectively and then saying, yep, you're good to drive. And so I think there's some merit in looking at the larger uh, brokers potentially being able to do that training and certification to our standards standard that would both uh, push it over into the private sector and make it much faster without compromising safety or quality. So I think that's worth exploring. A lot of the other stuff, I do agree with Councillor Russell that uh, taxi drivers, because of the nature of actually picking people up at the side of the road, is a different kind of beast and probably does need some higher standards. But I don't think we've necessarily nailed it yet. And I think that there is still more discussion to be had. So uh, I just wanted to throw that in there. And Councillor Kent, do you want to uh, close or are we good and should we go to a vote? I just want to say that I would also um, iterate the same the same concerns around safety. I, I think for me as a woman as well, and some of the uh, difficult and and very concerning and that concerns incidents that we've had over the last ten years here in Halifax around uh, taxi and all of that. I I certainly would not be one who would be put putting anything on the table to lessen safety standards. Um, I think that we have a responsibility if we, and, and council certainly, we, we brought forward the TNC program and because we were not satisfied with the, the taxi industry that we had, but in fairness and in, in, in looking forward, 
we have another opportunity to strengthen this. And I think that's if that's where we can come out at the end with this report coming back to us to make a good, solid decision that really could benefit both and still protect uh, the, the drivers and the residents who utilize this industry, then that's that's where I'm going with it. So thank you, Council, for or for members for considering it. And that's all I need to say for now. Thank you, Vice Chair Kent. Uh, Councillor Stoddard would like to close on your behalf. Councillor Stoddard. <laughs> I'm not closing. I'm just making a comment. <laughs> I just have a question. Um, is there any way we monitor complaints um, between the two um, industries, I guess, between taxis and uh, TNC? Well, because it's a motion uh, to start this process, there's no staff here to speak to it, but there is. the the That was one of the big changes was to be able to have access to uh, data from both the brokers and also to have a clearer path for this kind of stuff. So that could be something that we could both uh, take away and ask staff to review with you, Councillor Stoddard, and uh, uh, some of that will be answered in the staff report. Okay. Anything further? No, that's good. Thank you. Question. Excellent. Question has been called. All those in favor of the motion is amended. Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Thank you very much. So that brings us to notice as a motion. Anybody want to load something up for next uh, month? Nope. Good. They'll all come in in the last three days. Sorry, staff. Oh, excellent. The date <laughs> of the next meeting. <laughs> you do that when you got Tony. <laughs> <laughs> the date of the next meeting is May 27th at 1 p.m. And I would ask for an adjournment. Someone may move to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Kent. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed your visit, Councillor.